population models or models coming from population dynamics are really a core application of dynamical systems. Really, really important. Let's dig in and begin with a predator-prey model. Now, there are lots of predator-prey models out there. This one is going to be continuous time due to Latka and Volterra, and it is a two-species model. So what we're going to do is we're going to model the sizes of two different populations. The first, whose size is going to be X, this has the property that it grows naturally. If you look at its intrinsic dynamics, they are of the form dx equals some constant r1 times x. Here r1 is going to be a positive constant, and what this guy is is the prey. This is like plants that just grow naturally, or bunnies that reproduce naturally. That's the first species. The second species, y, has different natural dynamics. y dies off without food. So if I were to write down the natural dynamics of y, it would be of the form dy equals minus a constant r2 times y. And here r2 again is a constant that is positive. That minus sign out in front means that y dies off. y is the predator. Now this system as written is uncoupled and it's boring. x gets big and y dies off. What happens next? Well, x meets y, and y eats x. And the question is, how often does that happen? One way to model this is to say that encounters between x and y are random, but their frequency is going to be proportional to the product, x times y. If there aren't many x's, or if there aren't many y's, then there won't be a lot of meetings. But if both are large, well, there's going to be quite a bit. With a little bit of work, we can derive the following coupled system, the Lotka-Volterra model. This is the following. dx equals x minus alpha times x times y and dy equals minus r times y plus beta times x times y. Now, alpha, beta, r, these are all positive constants. What we've done is we've played around with the linear terms a little bit, normalizing x to have natural growth rate 1, and then the r constant in front of the y, that's sort of a ratio of growth rates between predator and prey. Those are the linear terms, but we also have some interesting nonlinear interactions, again, based on this frequency of meeting. What we've done is we've chosen constants alpha and beta to reflect the benefit to y accrued by y eating x, that's encoded in this constant beta, as well as the detrimental effect on x of that consumption. That's encoded in that alpha constant with the negative sign out in front. Okay, so we've got this model. What are we going to do? We're going to do what we always do. That is look for the equilibria. Let's begin with dx dt, which is factoring out an x. We have x times quantity 1 minus alpha y. I set that equal to 0, and I see that my solutions are either x equals 0 or y equals 1 over alpha. If I do the same thing with dy dt, factoring out a y to get y times quantity negative r plus beta times x, I set all that equal to 0. Then again, I have two solutions, y equals 0 or x equals r divided by beta. Now, there's a little bit of logic going on here because I have an and between two statements, and I have ors within these statements. But with a little bit of work, we see that there are exactly two equilibria. The first one is at the point 0, 0. And that's kind of boring. That means uh, everybody's dead and there's nothing. The second equilibrium is where x equals r over beta and y equals 1 over alpha. These are both positive numbers. That's good. And this is a coexistence equilibrium. That means that these two species, the predator and the prey, are in equilibrium. And everyone's happy, as happy as prey can be. 
Now to classify these equilibria, we're going to look at the derivative, the right hand side as a function of the sizes x and y is the first output is x minus alpha times x times y. The second output is minus r times y plus beta times x times y. The derivative of this function is the two by two matrix whose entries are in the first column, the partial with respect to x, we have one minus alpha times y for the first entry. For the second entry, we have beta times y. The second column, the partials with respect to y are minus alpha times x and beta times x minus r. Now what we need to do is take this derivative evaluate it at both equilibria. Let's begin with the equilibrium at the origin. Here, we get something really simple. We get the diagonal matrix 1, 0, 0, negative r. We can see exactly what the eigenvalues are. They are 1 and negative r, and since r is positive, this is a saddle. We can see what the eigenvectors are. They're the x and y axis. This is an uncoupled system. That means that you're growing along the x axis and you're decaying along the y axis. This is what the local dynamics near the origin looks like. Okay, now what about at the interesting equilibrium? At x equals r over beta, y equals 1 over alpha, we take that derivative that we already computed, evaluate it there, and we get the matrix 0 minus r times alpha over beta, beta over alpha 0. This is a matrix that has trace 0 and positive determinant, and that means by our classification that we have a center. Whoa, wait a minute, remember, we can't necessarily trust those centers. The hartman grobman theorem comes in and says, watch out, is this really a true center? How are we gonna figure that out? Well, I'm going to tell you, it really is a true center. I claim that this is a conservative system. There is an integral that is constant along solutions. And I'm just gonna tell you what it is. Consider the function capital Phi that is equal to beta times x minus r times log of x plus alpha times y minus log of y. How do I check that this is constant long solutions? Well, just compute d phi dt. If we do that with a little bit of chain rule action, what do we get? We get for the first term beta times dx dt. For the second term, minus r over x times dx dt. For the third term, alpha times dy dt. And for the fourth term, minus 1 over y times dy dt. Now remembering what dx dt and dy dt are and plugging those into the equation with a little bit of factoring out algebraic manipulation, we get a final answer that clearly turns out to be zero. You can check this. What this means is that the level sets of phi are precisely the orbits of this system, the curves that are traced out. And that's going to imply, by checking what the level sets are, that we've got a true center. And that's it. That's what we were trying to show. Now, what does this mean for us? This means that we can draw a full diagram of what's going on. We have a saddle at the origin, and we have this one equilibrium that is a nonlinear center, and the entire rest of the positive quadrant of the plane is filled up with level set curves of this function. These are not going to be circles or even ellipses. They're going to be a little bit weirder than that. But in practice, what this means is that all orbits, except for those two equilibria, are going to be periodic. We're going to start off, let's say, with low numbers of predator, low numbers of prey. In the absence of a lot of predators, the prey increases and we get to a state of high x, low y. When there's plenty of food, well, that has an effect on the growth rate of the predators. We get more and more predators until we're in a situation where there's lots of predators, lots of food, and those predators do what? They overconsume, and then the food supply goes down, and then the predators start dying off, and you're back to the state where you started. 
That is the Lacavoltera predator-prey model.